Hi, I'm professional sports handicapper Ross Benjamin, host of the Winner's Circle Sports Betting Podcast. As always, I'm joined by my counterpart, Mr. Chip Chirimbus out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Chip, how are you? I hope your weekend was good. Better than mine because I didn't have a very good weekend with the football plays. Well, it came out all right. We went uh, three and two on Sunday with our Fab Five. And uh, Saturday, it looked like we were ready to really easily close in on, on a tremendous 4-2 uh, day with a best bet winner. And all of a sudden, UCLA just blows a 20-point lead in the fourth or 18-point lead in the fourth quarter alone. And uh, getting points, we still didn't prevail in that one. Uh, very disappointing there. But, uh, you know, it's it's been uh, good overall, and college basketball keeps right on chiming along there, Ross. Uh, a couple of big big winners we had this week: Missouri over Illinois, and things along those Great lines. Call so, there. Great call. Yeah, thank you. So I'm really happy with uh, what I'm seeing. I have a slate of basketball today, and um, you know I think Ross, without the NBA being here right now, it's a little bit easier to focus in on some of these games. They had a clearer head, and and maybe even in football, with there being a, a smaller schedule, has hurt us a lot. We've mentioned that we're losing big games, but it's also for me, I've been able to concentrate on um, focus on particular games and, and it's helped me, I think. Yeah. I mean, just before we went on air, you know, I'm checking, well, here are the key games. Let's talk about these today and our early lo- or outlook and referring to college football and the PAC 12 title game that was, uh, initially going to be Washington and USC is now Oregon and USC because Washington still has COVID issues. Washington was supposed to play Oregon last week, Chipper, and Washington had to cancel the game because of the COVID issues. The winner of that game was supposed to play USC in the Pac-12 title game. So I think the Pac-12 is rightfully so um, penalizing Washington in this regard, but it sort of puts a little bit of a damper, doesn't it? On the uh, takes well, away from the importance of the game kind of thing. Well, you know, Ross, if they didn't wait until November 5th to start their season, yeah. maybe um, other conferences had started to play and, and they had managed to go through it. And, you know, you would have been able to make adjustments on the fly as that was happening. And, um, you know, so I, I sort of think they got what they deserve. I think, uh, you know, like I, we've talked before about educators, I think are um, uh, the each one, they come up with the wildest and the most ridiculous idea because each one's trying to outdo the other and prove that they're smarter than the other guy. And um, they just don't have any common sense when it comes to this stuff. If you start in September and you could have canceled some of these games and they would have been able to play maybe a full schedule over a 14 week or 16 week of venues. But the way they, the way they set it up, they were just afraid of their own shadow. Yeah. I mean, look, they can't, let's not forget these seasons were canceled in the past yeah. 12 in the big 10. Yeah. Then they changed their mind because of pressure uh, from the public and, and from the players and from, from parents of the players and, and from the fan base and uh, from the television networks. So, and they caved in and this is what they're left with. So I don't mean to be vindictive, but you get what you deserve sometimes. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. who gets penalized with all this is the kids. And let's face it, Chip, when we talked before the season started, my main concern with this COVID-19 issue wasn't in terms of football. Okay. Not general life because it's, it's a problem enough in our a society today. But in terms of making games happen, fulfilling schedules, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a prophet, but I, I constantly emphasize the fact that it was going to be very difficult in college football to keep 19, 20, 21-year-old kids, sometimes 18-year-old kids, uh, tell them they have to live in a proverbial bubble or, or to be safe. You know what I mean? Especially in states like California, which in Florida, which aren't really enforcing uh, the, the leaders of those states really aren't enforcing the protocols that need to be put in place with this yeah. COVID-19. Mm-hmm. So very frustrating all the way around, Chipper. Yeah, it's, a uh, you know, like I said, they get off to a late start and they get what they deserve and, and they're probably going to be left out of, of the big games. And uh, well, that's a discussion for another matter, I think, when we're talking about the expansion. But yeah. uh, well, let's get to the games that are being. Played. Yeah, let, let's um, get to what we have. 
Let's have a couple games that we're going to talk about. Uh, we have two on Friday night that were originally scheduled for Saturday, Nebraska at Rutgers and Purdue at Indiana. Um, Nebraska at Rutgers, let's start with that one, Chipper. Uh, Nebraska opened as a six-point favorite, and now they're a six-and-a-half-point road favorite against a Rutgers team coming off a big win on Saturday. Yeah, I'm really disappointed in myself. Last Saturday, I pulled the trigger on Nebraska, got beat outright, and let uh, Rutgers slide against Maryland, and they won outright. So I'm sort of twixt and bewildered about this one, Ross. You know what I'm saying? When, you, when your mind sees these two clashing after coming up, making a wrong decision on one side and a wrong decision on the other in the previous week. But I still think that uh, this Rutgers team is playing pretty tough right now, but they're a five-point dog at home. and um, you know, either the odds makers really enamored with this Nebraska, or they're a lot better than I am giving them credit for. Uh, surprised that they're a favorite in New Jersey on this one. Yeah, um, not so much surprised they're a favorite, but the size of the favorite they are. Right. And that's, that's more it, or less what I meant. Yes. Yeah, and then they moved to six and a half from the opening number of six. So even more, you know, baffling, I should say. But, you know, Chipper, these are two teams that are hard to gauge. And I think that's where you're going with that, you know. Uh, you think Nebraska's coming on, and then they lay an egg at home against Minnesota, who isn't a very good football team this year. Right. Um, and then Rutgers, uh, you, they look like they were on the downslide, and lo and behold, they go to Maryland as a three-and-a-half-point underdog and knock off the Terps, who had – uh, we're on a two game win streak. So Shiano's done a nice job. I, I would tend to look for a reason to use the home underdog in this situation, but still a bit early to make a call there. Yeah. Um, Purdue and Indiana a game that was supposed to take place last Saturday and got canceled because of COVID issues on both sides. Um, but they're scheduled to play on Friday evening, 7 30 PM Eastern time in Bloomington, uh, the in-state battle between these two and Indiana, boy, what a nice year they're having, but you know, Chipper, they opened at 10 and a half in this game and now they're down to nine and a half awfully quickly. Well, you know, I think if this game had been played last week and I, I I'm not quite sure about you, but I know I probably was going to use Purdue as a play. And it was just the timing and the situation and the play for it. I don't like when this team's had an extra five, six days for that emotional, um, you know, drama or that, to change. I mean, there may be, uh, there, if they were psyched, they may have lost their intensity. And if they weren't quite ready, they may have been able to pick up um, some, a positive vibe. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant on this game, but you know, is this the one that's called the old oaken bucket? I mean, this, um, I think uh, the big rivalry between these two, I know these two are big rivals, Purdue and, and the University of Indiana. So um, I would naturally tend toward, um, to look toward the dog and the underdog. And uh, it's, Purdue has been disappointing after opening the season against Iowa with that win, but we've played against them a few times and made some money. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a little surprised. I'm looking at the money distribution in terms of volume of bets right now. And the majority are over 80% have come in on Purdue in the early going. So, wow, that makes me scratch my head even more when you got a nationally ranked team like Indiana. Now, of course, Indiana lost their starting quarterback. We know that. Uh, but you know, uh, they're, they still, uh, against Wisconsin came up with a 14 to six win, but how big a win is that at Wisconsin? Now, when we saw how bad the Badgers have looked the last few weeks and boy, did they really hurt us on Saturday? I, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now that chips made that clear, I don't blame them. I don't want to talk about oh, it. No, you know, what did we say this, the, uh, uh, the first sign of insanity is doing the same thing over again, over again, expecting a different result. Exactly. Well, that's the Wisconsin Badgers. You can have them. I don't care. How could they be 11 point favorites, 10 point favorites this week? Again, I just don't believe it. They, they can't score yeah. 10 points in a game and are 11 point favorites. All right. Well, well, how about this game? I mean, it's not of national implications as far as playoff seating or a major bowl. But it's still two service academies facing each other. Air Force and Army, and we discussed this off air. And uh, I indicated to you, I thought this was a real danger spot for the Army uh, cadets here. Coming off that win against Navy, 15 to nothing. This is an Air Force team that has uh, 16 days of rest, 15 days of rest, excuse me, going into this contest. Chipper, 
Air Force is three and two, but their strength of schedule in those five games much t- tougher than what Army faced last week. I feel like I'm being redundant because I said the same yeah. thing about Navy. Yeah. But it, to me, our, you know, this is an Air Force team opened a year with a 40 to seven win over Navy. They're only two losses, Chip, at San Jose State, who's six and zero right now. And, and at Boise State, who I believe is six and one or seven and one. Matter of fact, those two teams are going to be playing for the Mountain West Championship on Saturday. Um, is it Saturday? Yes, the Mountain West Championship yep. title game on Saturday. So, I mean, nothing to be ashamed of there. And uh, Army, you know, here's the other thing, Chip. Um, Army's used to closing the year against Navy. Now they come up with that big emotional win. Now it's the commander in chief's uh, trophy yeah. at stake. Uh, is this a dangerous spot? Like I see it in your eyes. Yeah. For more reasons than that. Um, you know, like you said, this air force lost two games, Boise States, no slouch. And we know San Jose state can play. We saw them the other night against Nevada. That's a really good football team. So um, they lost the two good football teams The emotional edge for Navy has got to be down. I told you, I mean, for the Army after beating Navy. Um, I told you these academies, 365 days a year, three meals each and every day before they can even bite a morsel of food, they have to chant, beat Navy. They're playing (laughs) Air Force this week. They beat Navy last week. So I don't think emotionally that they can quite be there, and I don't think they're as good. Their schedule is really, you know, it's nothing. If their schedule had, if they played any of any of the type of teams that the Navy played or that the Air Force played, they're not going to be six and zero at home or seven and zero at home. It's just I don't. I think the Army's in a, a spot. The cadets are really to take a fall here, and I I think the the Air Force are ready to to just uh, take them apart. Really. Yeah. Look how close the last three meetings were. Uh, Air Force last year seventeen thirteen Army in two thousand eighteen seventeen fourteen. Uh, Army in 2017, uh, 21. I mean, these have been close games the last couple seasons. Uh, You know, another thing, Chip, really interesting, the total, like the Navy game, is hovering around 38, which is extremely low for a college football game. But as we saw last week, you know, with the Army-Navy game last Saturday, I should say, uh, easily went under the total. You know, this, this is an interesting note here, Chip because I know you like this kind of stuff. Um, Army against Navy and Air Force, the last six years, all 12 of those games have gone under the total. Wow. Yeah, so these service academies, not only are they run-oriented offenses with the triple option attack, but the defenses face those offenses on a daily basis in practice. So it's not like there's a real adjustment period there. That's how I what I take yeah. away from that. Matter of fact, Army, uh, the game going under against Navy, they now gone the Army Navy games the last twelve years. All twelve have gone under the total. Jesus, excuse me for that, but uh, <laughs> you know I didn't quite realize that. You know because I, I don't follow the totals as closely as you do. But you know that's something to make note of. And you know what? Some people say, well, they're due to, to go over. I don't think so. I think you just keep playing under until it finally goes over. I mean, uh, again, uh, you're talking about two triple option attacks that go on a lot of times, long time consuming drives and two defenses that are used to facing. I mean, it's one thing trying to prepare for a military academy's triple option attack with only one week to prepare. It's a non-conference game. You're not used to seeing them. I get that, but this is a whole different circumstances. These, uh, these schools are very um, familiar with each other, and I think that speaks uh, volumes to why these games have gone under at the pace they have. Anyway, Northwestern and Ohio State on Saturday in the Big Ten title game, Chipper. This looks like a lopsided matchup to me, and it certainly appears to the bookmakers the same way. Ohio State currently a 20-and-a-half-point favorite in this game. I'm trying to think of how Northwestern can stay in this contest, Chip. You know, Ross, they've been a great cover, haven't they? Um, um the Wildcats. I mean, I, I think did they did they cover against Illinois last time out, or was that game canceled last week? But um, it just seems like uh, Northwestern uh, gets up and bites you. Uh, um, I have difficulty taking the points here because I don't know how they're going to score, Ross. Yeah, that's um, the thing. How do they manufacture points? Yeah, 
Yeah. And it's not like this is the best version of Ohio state defense that we've right. seen in uh, past years, but I mean, look at, uh, this is a team that got held to seven points against Wisconsin or 17 against Wisconsin, 20 against Michigan state, 21 against Nebraska, 21 against Iowa. Uh, so they're not an offensive jor- juggernaut by any yeah. stretch of the imagination and chip. They've gone under the total in one, two, three, six or seven games this year. Um, that I see, let me see here real quickly. Yeah. Six or seven games. And to answer your question, yeah, they're uh five, one and one against the spread this year. Uh, their only non cover came as a 13 and a half point favorite at Michigan state who somehow upset them uh, because I think Michigan state is horrible. How did that happen? Yeah, exactly. My thoughts. Uh, this will be only the second time they're a dog this season. The prior time, was their home game against Wisconsin, uh, and they defeated them 17-7 to in that role as a seven-point dog. Yep. Uh, we look on the other side of the equation, and um, Ohio State is 3-0-2 and two to the over this year, uh, an offensive juggernaut by every stretch of the imagination, uh, averaging – what are they averaging per game? Well, let's take a look. 52, 38, 49, 42, 52. They're averaging a lot, Chip. 40, it's like 45, 46 points. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they failed to cover on two occasions. Once is a 38-point favorite against Rutgers. And the other time was that uh, game against Indiana, which they led 35-7 to seven and let Indiana back in the game. Uh, they prevailed 42-35, but they – uh, failed to cover as a 20 and a half point favorite. Their last game two weeks ago at Michigan State, 52 to 12, covering easily as a 22 point favorite. So, I, again, uh, I scratch my head here and say uh, this line might not be enough uh, yeah, as well, far as I'm concerned. It, I agree. And, and you know, are, are we thinking like a bookmaker here, Ross? Um, I, I it, looks would, like, it looks like an easy number to you know 20 and 21 are, are huge numbers we understand that but it looks like it's a little bit easier to lay it than to take it for you know because i don't see how northwestern is going to come up with, with points how are they yeah. going to keep up with this team if this team scores their average in the 40s and say northwestern's defense is is better than usual they score 35 you still you still need this team to score 14 points for a yeah. push and i don't i don't see how it happens you know, Ohio State's statistically not a, as good a defense, like I alluded to, as they have been in uh, years past. However, they have forced 13 turnovers in five games, Chip. And wow. boy, pretty- you know, that'll cover up a lot of defensive deficiencies when that what, happens. What's the total on this game, Ross? Uh, the total on this game as we speak is 58 and a half, which seems high. You know, when, when you, when you think of a Northwestern game, yeah. but that tells yeah. me, you know, it's with the total Ohio that State. high, they expect Ohio state to put up a lot of points. Cause like exactly. you said, where's the points going to come from, from Northwestern. So um, the, the flip side of that equation, which we never like to see is as expected, a ton of money has come in on Ohio state uh, and the under to start with. So. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we'll we'll talk about this on our Thursday show as well. And that, uh, go ahead. That's an early start, right, Ross? That game starts at noon Eastern. Uh, let's see here. I think Ohio State and yes, that's a noon Eastern you know, time was, start. So the best thing I can feel about this game is that it's going to get out of the way real soon. <laughs> you know, as far <laughs> as the days, the days concerned, I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's almost like some people are going to be out there just spitefully cheering for Northwestern because of the way Ohio State now has been added yeah. to inclusion in the college football 14 playoff if they win this game. Uh, basically, if they win this game, it's going to be hard to leave them out. But boy, oh boy, I don't want to revisit that subject. I know, I know. That's way, way too time consuming and it gets me perturbed. It's getting old too. Yeah, exactly. Clemson at Notre Dame, Chip. Wow. Clemson versus Notre Dame. I take that back in the ACC title game. Right. Uh, we were a little surprised. This line opened at 10 and even more so it's now gone up to 10 and a half. Boy, oh boy. Uh, that's a telltale sign to me. The books are saying, well, they're, I'm begging you to take Notre Dame as an underdog. In I agree. Spot. 
I agree. You know, when, when we had discussed the um, the eye test, we had we both agreed that Clemson looked like the weakest of the four of the big four that we have seen. And uh, they they met up with Notre Dame earlier in the year. And and I had told you and, I, you know, we discussed I was looking to play Notre Dame again. I said, because people are going to go running to this Clemson side. And I expected the number, of course, to be somewhere around five and a half, six. I mean, that way, even lower. But this double-digit number um, really puts me in a, in a tough spot because I'm, I'm, I w- was looking at this game, Ross, in a whole different manner. And now I'm saying maybe the public's right because this is a, the odds maker thinks that Clemson is the much better team here. And they didn't show that when they played the first time. And I expect them to be a little bit of, of Tiger money to come against the Irish because they lost to them the first time out. But this number sort of just flattens the whole attitude for me. Yeah, and you know, uh, Notre Dame, whenever they play, they're going to get a lot of action. So that you really can't gauge how much money comes in on Notre Dame because uh, it's all, there's always going to be that percentage of players that are going right. to play Notre Dame every week because they're right. diehards with their loyal fan base. Um, so that's what makes it a little more difficult to gauge this line and where the money's going. Uh, but, man... Uh, you know, I know Trevor Lawrence was out of the first game chipper, but the, the kid, the, the backup quarterback, the true freshman, threw for 439 yards in that game. And, I mean, and how much better could Trevor Lawrence have done? Like I had said, Notre Dame scored, it was a 48 points in that game. I mean, 47 Trevor, 40 in overtime. All right, in overtime. And But Trevor Lawrence doesn't tackle anybody. Yeah. Um, they didn't stop the Notre Dame um, offense. 519 so, yards Notre Dame had, Chip. Well, so now is, is Trevor Lawrence going to make that much of a difference? Or I think there's got to be more of a, a, a team attitude and, um, uh, or, you know, maybe this team has just been sleepwalking through the whole season, waiting for this opportunity yeah, yeah. and um, waiting for the playoffs because they were, they were high expectations. They were ranked number one, I think at the beginning over Alabama, if I'm not, you know, maybe I'll, it doesn't really matter at the beginning before they played any games, but they were expected to be where they are right now. I just didn't expect them to be a 10 and a half point favorite after the performance we had seen the entire year. If it was years past and we had, we had had that kind of resume to work on and even, and Notre Dame's resume is so impressive to me, the way they've won games. I mean, they yeah. just dominated people. They dominated North Carolina. It's the same North Carolina team that crushed Miami on yeah. Saturday, by the way, who was red hot and getting a lot of accolades is uh, back into the top 10. Uh, the, the, the Canes are back. Well, the Canes were evidently not back because, uh, boy, oh boy, wow. 700, over 700 yards of total offense and 500 yards rushing by the Tar Heels in that game. Imagine that, that. Really, really, it shocked me. It really did. Not that they won the game. Uh, cause I know you, uh, had a lean toward North Carolina, but I'm sure you would agree the manner in which they did. So I got off the game, Russ, because I, there was, they were such a popular side. Um, the Tar Heels were the service sides. The wise guys were, were taking the Tar Heels. And I said, you know, maybe this Miami team is better than, than I anticipated early in the year. You know, I liked North Carolina. So I got off the game and I truly was shocked. But we did cover the total. Um, we won the over on that one. <laughs> and anyway, um, one key point to that first matchup is Clemson was miss, missing a couple key players on the defensive side yeah. of the ball. So we have to take that into account. You know, and then I look at last week, um, or their last game, it was at Virginia Tech. Uh, in that game, they were 22-and-a-half point road favorite. That game was a 17-10 game late in the third quarter before they pulled away. Very unimpressive. It sort of reminded me of that Georgia Alabama game where it was close. And then all of a sudden with five minutes to go in the third period, um, you know, everything started to fall apart. The wheels came off and that happened uh, in that game for Virginia tech because they were fighting them tooth and nail and Clemson was all overly impressive in that game. But I, I actually believe, I think on three straight times down, um, they got defensive um, touchdowns that got set up by block punts and fumbles and, and the, the game, the game was history. It just got away from him real yeah. fast. After it's snowball, that. it's snowballed on uh, yeah. Virginia tech real quick. And uh, I will say this, I think the uh, Notre Dame wide receiver unit has got steadily better uh, as the season has progressed. And I can't tell you how impressed I am with Ian book. He's not a first round talent. 
uh, like Trevor Lawrence. He doesn't have the arm strength of a Trevor Lawrence. He may not even have the mobility, even though he's got the ability to make plays with his legs. But the kid is intelligent. He makes very few mistakes. And uh, he's getting the job done this year. And he's shown me a lot improvement in the passing game as well. And, you know, you mentioned the receivers. The receivers are big. Yes. I mean, physically big. And that tight end, he's a pro. I can't even tell you his name right now, but that kid's a player. Yeah. And um, they've got hands. You know, they Notre Dame receivers in the past just haven't been – I think they're a quality group. And, and this Ian Book has matured so much. I mean, he – how do you pronounce his last name anyway, Ross? Did I say <laughs> Did I say it correctly? Not that Book. it matters. Yeah. Not that it matters to me. B O O K. You can't screw that one up, Al Michaels. Well, I'm an educator. You never. By the way, where were you last night? My Buffalo Bills on national TV, and you and Michelle Tafoya take the day off. Oh God! Thank God Tafoya took the day off. <laughs> That's a tough fact. Um. Anyway, I don't want to. Oh, how did you bring her name up? You have no idea of my relationship with her. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'd love to know when we get done with the show. That's I'll tell you when we get off. Um, yeah, no, let's get back to this Notre Dame receiving core and their quarterback. I think they're good, and that's why I'm so shocked about this number. And I think their receivers are um, much better than they've had in the past. They really we'll see do. how this line develops. Again, I said Thursday we're going to rediscuss these games. It'll be Wednesday. Uh, because our format now Mondays, we're going to be talking about an early look at college football tomorrow. We'll take an early look at the NFL, um, and, and look back on what happened in, uh, week 14. Is it, is it 14, 15, 15. Okay. Um, so whatever week it is, we're going to take a look back at the games last week finished on Monday night with the Baltimore Cleveland game anyway. <laughs> and we're going to look ahead to next week, but in college football, uh, we're going to be rehashing some of these games and the line movements on Wednesday. Then Thursday will be our late edition of our NFL report. And on Friday, like we did last Friday, Chipper, we, we each gave a free pick in college football in the NFL. And I gave a free pick in the college football in the NFL. You did as well. And uh, we're going to do the same thing on Friday. And folks, we want to combine three and one on that show on Friday. And having said that, we still got a lot of complaints from people that we took way too long to get into the free picks. Folks, I just want to make this clear to you, okay? Watching and following us is very important to me. But we're not going to change the format because you are too impatient to wait till we give out the free picks, okay? We have this is a podcast, it's not a free pick video. We changed the format for Fridays to try to help some people out. And obviously we did. Uh, I apologize if it's not what you want, uh, but I would have to say that if you want to continue to watch, that's great. Uh, you're going to have to be a little more patient. If not, there's a lot of people who will watch us. So having said all that, um, let's get to the next game that we're going to talk about chipper, the Alabama Crimson Tide and the Florida Gators in the SEC ah. title game. And boy, some of the zest and vigor, came out of this game after Florida was upset as a 23 point home favorite by LSU on Saturday. Well, you know, Ross, if, if Florida had won, now this is a major upset in our minds, right? If Florida had won, we thought that, you know, um, they'd be coming into this game and they'd have a chance to beat Alabama. And that I was anticipating if they had won, that they would be a 21 or 20 point dog, much like the Northwestern is the Ohio state. Now it's only 17 Ross. And I think that's a very shallow number. And I, I think maybe Florida got caught peeking ahead. They knew they were going to be in this game no matter what. And um, maybe that's the reason they got caught by the Tigers last week. But I think this is a very short number. I think that Florida, I'm going to take a look at Florida at this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to use them. But look at the scores that this Alabama team has beaten everybody. Yeah. And like I've been saying all year long, don't count any of the SEC games because that's one of the weakest conferences in the country once you take Alabama out. So, I mean, Auburn certainly wasn't anything this year. LSU isn't anything this year. Mississippi State can't win a game. This entire conference has always – George is a major disappointment this year. So, um, you know, I just don't see it. Yeah, and if you want to look at common opponents, uh, the Crimson Tide went to LSU last week and won 55-17. On Saturday, the <laughs> Florida Gators hosted LSU and lost 37-34.
Uh, I said this to you off air. I'm going to say it again. Uh, what concerns me in this game with the Florida Gators is this is not the Florida defenses we've been used yeah. to seeing in years past. And I, I laughed and told you, Chip, it's too bad they couldn't take some of their past defenses over the last five years and put it with this <laughs> offensive unit. Yeah. They might have had a chance at a national title. And uh, But, boy, they could score. There's no two ways about it. They averaged 41 points per game, 513 yards of total offense per game. But they're also giving up 26 a game and 385 yards a game, Chip. You know? Yeah, um, well, you know, the, the Alabama offense is so well balanced. It's Matt Jones. He, he could be a number one pick in my head, and it wouldn't bother me at all because I think he's that good. And they've got the speed and the running backs. I mean, Bama's just going to come at you in so many different ways. They can return kicks. And um, I, I am, I'm just, I am surprised, Ross, that this game, this game isn't 20. I mean, if Ohio State can be 20 over Northwestern, why yeah. can't this team be 20? Well, I think uh, if you want me to play the devil's advocate, I think Florida's a much better team than Northwestern. You're okay. In, in my opinion. I mean, again, I think if Florida plays Northwestern on a neutral field, you'd be looking at probably they're going to be anywhere from a, on an 11 to 13 point and, favorite minimum. And, but, here, Ross, here the Gators coming off a loss to one of the, the worst teams in the entire conference. I mean, yeah. LSU has been absolutely putrid. I mean, yeah, uh, well, you're right. I mean, they were three and five going into that game and had given up a ton of yards. And, uh, you know, they they still gave up over 400 yards to uh, f to Florida. But, you know, here's my case in point right here, Chip. Um, LSU had 619 yards of total offense in that game against Florida. Okay. The week before uh, against a team, Tennessee, who's pretty much struggled offensively all year, they gave up 452 yards the week before that against Kentucky, a team that's noted for their defense in a terrible offense. They were able to rack up 418 yards on the Gators. And uh, you know, so Oh, I take that back, Chip. I stand corrected. I'm looking at their offensive numbers. But you know, but it, it's still all right because I mean, we understand the point because uh, Florida just doesn't doesn't play the kind of defense that no. they have in the past. And you know, didn't LSU start um, um, a former pro uh, quarterback son uh, for the first yes. time? Yes. Um, I the, uh, I can't think of his name off the the guy who won the uh, Ripon. No, no, the, the Super Bowl for Brad Johnson's kid. Brad Johnson. Remember Brad Johnson who won the Super Bowl with Tampa Bay over the old Oakland Raiders back in, uh, I, I want to say 2001. So by the way, and he's way, a lefty have, as opposed to his father. I have an answer to a question that we asked the opening week. <laughs> What's that? Who did the, that freshman, that quarterback from South Carolina that started, he's supposed to be a senior in high school. And he started as a, as a freshman at South Carolina a number of years ago, transferred and went to the University of Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Brantley. That was it. We, I remember we Scott couldn't Bentley. Bentley. Ben, Where did he go? Bentley. 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 Where did he go? Where did he go? Yeah. Hey. Went to Utah. He's doing awfully well there. I mean, they got off to a rough start, but um, he played, he had they a good game on Saturday, didn't he? Yeah, well, that was a big win for us. We posted them out. Maybe that's why I brought them up. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you call him Bentley and not Brantley, leave it Brantley, to what is it? I mean, listen, <laughs> I've, I've written in the Bentley before. I like it much better than the Brantley. Oh, you're too much. Uh, the Mountain West Championship game, you know, you got a brand name in Boise State against uh, what usually is a conference doormat in San yeah. Jose State. And boy, oh, boy. Had their fortunes changed this year? Surprisingly so. We thought that San Jose State would be improved, but they're 6-0 and right now, Chipper. And as you alluded to, big win over Nevada on Friday evening uh, come in comeback style. And uh, Boise State is Boise State, 5-1. and one. Their only loss coming against BYU. Uh, but uh, right now, Boise State is a 6.5-point favorite in this contest which will be played at Sam Boyd Stadium in Las Vegas, Nevada, because San Jose State can't play any home games right now uh, because of all the restrictions in the Bay Area. Uh, what's your thoughts here, Chip? Well, it's going to be an outdoor venue. Realize that. You know, Tom Zemeck is out. Excuse me. Sam Boyd is outside. Yeah. And um, 
I'm really impressed with the San Jose team. You know, they opened the season by beating an Air Force team who we were just um, pouring accolades on. And um, I saw them play that Nevada team. I had the wrong side there. And it was evident even when Nevada had the lead, I'd never felt very good in that game. And once San Jose, once the Spartans got, in, got into contention in that game, they just, they just were in control and command the rest of the way. It really wasn't as close as it, as it might have appeared. Um, I have to be impressed with them, and I guess the odds makers are too. Boise lost their only game when their quarterback was down against BYU, got annihilated, but they're under a touchdown here on a neutral site. I think they're really anticipating a good game between these two, and if they let me go, I might run down there and be able to watch it peek through the fence or something. There you go. And you know what? Um, San Jose defensively has been very good, Chipper, and a lot of people don't realize that. The Spartans are only allowing 17.5 points per game, uh, about 350 yards of total offense. Five of their six games have gone under the total. Uh, they're 5 0 oh, 1 against the spread, which doesn't shock me because, uh, in retrospect, here they're 1 2 3. They've been an underdog in three of their six games this year, even though they're 6 and 0. Oh. So, uh, again, something to keep an eye on. Uh, on the other hand, Boise coming off a lackluster 17-9 to win at Wyoming, a game in which I had the Cowboys as an 11-point underdog at home. And uh, you can give them a little bit of a pass there, Chipper. The game was played in a snowstorm. Well, um, so, in, in, you know, in Wyoming... Yeah, go I'm ahead. sorry. I'm sorry. Wyoming has one of the one of the biggest home field advantages. Not only mm-hmm. that's it's the weather, but the the altitude. They're they're playing in a, in a really high environment, and um, teams they catch a lot of teams there. We had them early in the year as, as a winner, I think against Fresno or whoever it was when they were in that situation, and um, I, that was a great call by you uh, taking them there and with the points. And you know, Boise was probably just happy to get out of there with a win. It's bottom line. That's what it looked like. Uh, you know, it, it was coming down. You could, there was fog. You could hardly see each other on yep. the field. Uh, it was one of them adverse uh, weather conditions. And what do you expect in the second week in, in Laramie, Wyoming anyway, which I think that's the latest a regular season game has ever been played in the state of Wyoming. And the weather definitely a factor. So, again, I will give uh, a Boise a pass for that performance. Uh, but you know what? Um, that was the first game they went under the total all year. So a little bit of contrast there with uh, San Jose State going under in five or six games this year, while San Jose going over in five of six games. Chipper, Monday night, tonight, Cleveland Browns and Baltimore Ravens. Really, really good game on uh, Monday night football. Uh, do you have anything going for tonight? Yeah, I do. I, I think this is an interesting matchup. Uh, the Browns, I think, may want this even more than the Ravens because of the way they opened the season, Ross. We had mentioned that they got clobbered 38-6 to six in the opening game, um, only scored once in the first quarter, never missed the extra point, never came back and scored again in the game. And, you know, after that game, they've won, what, 9 of 11? And they've established themselves as having the, the best running duo in the NFL. Um, some other teams may have more yards, but no one has a one-two punch like this team with um, Chubb and Hunt. And, uh, you know, they, do they need it? I mean, have they qualified for the playoffs already, Ross? I'm not quite no, sure. No, they, they have not qualified already, but, they, but their, their probability of qualifying – is over 90% right now. All right, so, but they still have incentive here, and I think um, the Ravens may be a, a tad different than they have. Well, they are a tad different than they have been in the past. Whether they can garner it back up here is, an, is another story. Very short number, which has gone up. I think the public, am I right, Ross? Has the public sentiment been on the Ravens here over the Browns? And, and maybe people are, are looking for the Browns to prove it to them that they really are a playoff caliber team. And that um, is correct. That is right. correct. As far as the money goes, yes. And uh, the other point, too, is uh, let's not forget, okay, let's not lose sight of the fact the Pittsburgh Steelers have lost two games in a row. And uh, Cleveland, with a win, will close within one game of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Wow. And <laughs> they still have a game left with Pittsburgh on their schedule. So uh, the Browns, do they have incentive not only from a playoff perspective, which – it would take an absolute meltdown on from this point on for Cleveland not to make it, uh, but they have higher aspirations of maybe catching the Steelers uh, for the AFC North title. Now, having said that, 
Baltimore, uh, with a loss here, you could virtually kiss their pay playoff yeah. uh, hopes goodbye. I mean, they'd be in the same position as the Raiders, where they're still mathematically alive, but they'd need to win out and then hope for a lot of help. Well, um, you know, the odds makers are giving them enough room where they can win and not cover the number. Yeah. So uh, this is going to be interesting tonight to see if it comes down. I, I, I'm looking forward to watching this game. Yeah, it's going to be real competitive. Um, here's what I got, Chipper. I got my NFL Monday night total of the year going tonight in this Cleveland Baltimore game. You can get it by going to my website, rbwins.com. That's rbwins.com. Folks, my NFL totals are 11 and four this year, 14 and four dating back to last year. And going back even further than that, I'm 42 and 25 with my last 67 NFL totals. That's all independently documented by a very credible site. If you need to know that, you can contact me. I certainly will steer you in that direction. But having said that, um, I'm also eight and four this year with my 12 Monday night selections in the NFL. That's rbwins.com. It's my NFL Monday night total of the year. And uh, be sure to visit Chip's site as well. That's chipwins.com. Any final thoughts, Chip, before we sign off? Uh, no, thank you, Ross. This is that the college basketball is posted up on the site, and I've got the Monday night football game, of course. And uh, we're posting basketball each and every day, and it's a, it's a chance for you to make money every night. For Ross Benjamin and Chip Chirimbus, thank you for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of the Winner's Circle Sports Betting Podcast. Until the next time, good luck and God bless.